Hi, Norma. How are you doing? Hi, Dave. <clears throat> welcome, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming early. I appreciate that. It's all good to get all the wrinkles ironed out before we dive in. Okay. Dave, do you want everybody unmuted? Oh, I can't hear you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? <clears throat> hey, Lucia, are you the one who's officially um, timekeeper tonight? No, Martha is. I was going to do You're the muted. Meeting. I can't hear you. Well, I wasn't. I oh, wait, no, me, I'm sorry. My speaker might have been off. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, and are you the official timekeeper tonight? No, Martha is, but, I am. but I'm going to do the muting and the unmuting for each person. Okay. Does that mean I'm going to have to turn my muting uh, off each time I'm called on? Because it no. became very difficult to, if I would try to turn it off ahead of time, then I would go back and find out it wasn't when I was ready to talk. I was not being permitted and I had to go through turning it back on. I don't have anybody coming in here making any noise, no dogs barking. Uh, my child is 50 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't make that promise. You may definitely hear dogs barking, cats wandering across. So Norma, yeah, why don't we try it where you just do your own muting and unmuting and um, if it becomes a problem, then I'll step in, but I don't Thank expect you. it to. <clears throat> Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six potential candidates uh, showing up tonight. Um, in addition, we have Martha, who's our official timekeeper. If you are a candidate speaking and you cannot see Martha, who's just raised her hand, let me know. <clears throat> let me pin her. How did you write I think in? I pin her um, and... So, hi, Martha. Hi. And can we unmute and mute ourselves? Hi, everyone. Hi, Martha. Hi. 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 I think the short answer is yes. All right. Um, but so, Dave, you don't want me to do the muting and unmuting. We'll let everybody do it for themselves. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think if all of a sudden something starts going haywire, you know, I've yeah. given you co hosts with our abilities. That's totally and you can, fine. You totally can, fine. Oh. <clears throat> Okay, let me make sure that I'm one, two, three, four, five. So we've got two more coming, or one more coming. <coughs> and uh, it's on. So did we hear, oh, there's Jose, okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, thank you. I think we've got everyone here. <clears throat> Um, I may um, end up unpinning myself. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I should stay in there. Um, okay, and everybody got a copy of, I think the schedule, correct? Of what, how we're gonna try to work it tonight. Um, if yeah. not, it's not a big deal. It's pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> we're basically, I think we've got four questions down here, depending on how it goes. Um, we may be limited to three. Um, the, the basic premise is two minutes of intro, one and a half minutes of per question, uh, and then two minutes for a closing statement at the end. <clears throat> we'll and see how it goes in terms of people showing up. Yes? I did, I did mix up the order all the way through so that it's not in one order. So uh, I tried to give everybody a chance to be first sometimes and last sometimes and in the middle other times so that it was as fair as I could make it. Thank you. Yeah, we're starting with the opening statements alphabetical by last name. Mm -hmm. 
So when when your time is getting close to being up, when you have 30 seconds left, I will show this. I hope it's not backwards on your screen as it is online. No, it's no not. Looks good. And then uh, 15 <laughs> seconds this. And then when it's time to stop, I'll rudely show this one with a bell. <laughs> Thank you. That works. Good. Okie dokie. Um, <clears throat> just so everybody is clear, the plan is that we are going to be recording this. In fact, it's recording now. I'll probably lop off the beginning of it where we're all just chit chatting um, if I can figure out how to do that. And that gets posted onto the, actually, it just goes to a YouTube channel and then we link to that um, <clears throat> uh, on the Tono website. And I think there's capacity if you want to share it to the community, you're, you have that ability as well. Um, and I will uh, have Martha and or Lucia um, send those to you uh, tomorrow once I get it uploaded. <clears throat> and I'm Dave Petey, I don't know if I made that clear. I'm the president, board president of Thousand Oaks Neighborhood Association. Thousand Oaks is um, about 1,850 homes and uh, uh, it's a great little community. I'm, I'm, I always like to say, you know, on, I, I'm a lead on next door and everybody, even people who love next door know that, know that it can be a cesspool. And Thousand Oaks, everyone's just very nicely behaved, I have to say. <laughs> Maybe that makes us super like bland, I don't know, but um, people, people seem to have, be able to have disagreements and still get along okay. <clears throat> well, bland is good in the year of 2020 at yeah. this point. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We don't need spicy. I don't know. Um, yeah, boy, man, it is a uh, a deal out there today, man. It just it just keeps coming. Um, okay, so we're almost at seven o'clock. The plan is that we'll have um, sort of a you know a few minutes of waiting time for people who either are having what I call you know stuck in traffic, which is meaning just sort of struggling with the technology. Um, and we have had problems people signing on to this. I'm, I'm still struggling to figure out why. Uh, we used Eventbrite as a way of registering people, but you do not have to have a Eventbrite. We have our Zoom link posted on our website and a Facebook page and on Nextdoor and stuff. So um, hopefully people aren't limited by that. But Does Eventbrite kind of steal an event for its own? No, no, it's just a way of facilitating um, messaging and getting people re registering people um, and so for instance there's an automated way where it'll send out a reminder you know two days ahead of time two hours ahead of time 10 minutes ahead of time so that you know that automation component is helpful in a lot of ways but um i've just been watching the third party interference go on the like the people collecting money you know it's all kinds of little interjections to get involved over someplace that's successful, like for example, this event. Um, and I will also tell folks that, um, so tomorrow night is the vice presidential debate. Obviously we have a hometown um, person to follow tomorrow. Um, and then on Thursday, <clears throat> Berkeley Mutual Aid is going to be doing what we call a ballot markup party. And the basic premise of that um, is something that I started with uh, Indivisible Berkeley a couple years ago. You know, these ballots are just so long, so complicated, so confusing, and you don't even know, um, you know, a judge, how am I supposed to vote for a judge? So it's a way uh, for community members to kind of join in on a Zoom meeting and share um, their thoughts for 60 seconds on a given candidate or a measure. And we start from the state proposition level down um, <clears throat> and then work I'll post the uh, Peace and Freedom Party's recommendations. We're usually widely sought after even by people who don't affiliate with the party for the uh, results that we give. Yeah, we're, we're recommending that people 
people not yeah. share like uh, organizational endorsements because people can find that information pretty readily online. So this is about community members sharing their personal thoughts about stuff um, and potential their sort of their specific perspective. So, you know, someone who has information about, you know, East Bay Regional Park District position or whatever. So, um, so it's not really one of those um, okay. who's endorsing who situations since that that stuff is sort of readily available okay we're at seven we, we do that kind of thing with my family across the state you know over 150 people who just get together and say what do you think about this yeah where's the professor what are you guys doing i kind of wonder if there's any other state that's kind of as ballot heavy as california uh, David, I was going to ask, is that meeting open only to the members of Thousand Oaks Neighborhood Association? No, no it is it's actually being, I'm, I'm also on the steering team for Berkeley Mutual Aid, and mm -hmm. it's actually a Berkeley Mutual Aid effort, um, <laughs> and uh, it is wide open uh, to anyone. It doesn't, you don't even have to be in Berkeley. Because we're starting from the top down, you could be joined from El Cerrito, and when, it, when all of a sudden it starts getting to Berkeley specific stuff, you can just log off or whatever. So um, no, it is wide open and uh, I'll send that link tomorrow as well. But if you go to uh, berkeleymutualaid.org, we should have a link up tomorrow. I think I don't think we have it up today. <clears throat> okay, we're at 703. I feel like I've done enough uh, chit chatting. Um, just wanna make sure we have everyone. Just gonna do a little roll call. Laura Babbitt. I'm here. Jose Luis Bedea. Bedoya present. Bedea, thank you. Uh, Michael Chang. Hello here. Thanks. Laura Harrison. Yeah. Respondi Arimani. Did I do that correctly? Yes. Thanks. Yes, I'm here. And Anna Vas Vasudev. Vasudev. Say yeah. it again. It's Vasudev. Vasudev. Okay. I've got a typo here, I think. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and start with um, two minute introduction as to who you are um, and we're going to be starting alphabetically so it's going to go in this order and I'm just going to let you hand it off to each person there's really no need for me to get in the way of this we're all running for school board here you should know your alphabetization okay it's going to be Laura, Jose, Michael, Norma, Esfandiar and Anna so take it away Laura. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Laura Babbitt, and I am the proud parent of three daughters who have attended or still attend Berkeley schools. My youngest just started the fifth grade. I was raised by educators who modeled creating change in our community. And this is why when I learned of all the issues in Berkeley schools, I felt the call to action and responded. Over the last 10 years, I have spent at least 40 volunteer hours a month working on or chairing all of our major district committees, PTAs, school site councils, and through this activism, I have helped to implement support versus discipline, social emotional counselors, family engagement specialists, special education support and reform, English language learner support, the hiring and retention of teachers of colors, and I've stopped budget cuts for educators. In response to COVID-19, I realized that leading from the sidelines was not going to be enough. We need a finance expert on our school board to help navigate the financial pressures the impending recession will bring. For the last 25 years, I've led million to billion dollar entities through two recessions by making data-driven decisions and creating efficiencies which reduce costs and save jobs. Through the lens of equity, I am committed to creating accountability structures so that our programs and special education services are implemented effectively. Two, providing outcome-oriented budgeting and cutting red tape. And finally, building collaborative welcoming school environments, which will include trauma-informed care and instruction. In closing, after years of constituents asking me to run for the school board, the time is now. I am endorsed by the Berkeley Teachers and Classified Staff Union, the Alameda County Democratic Party, six out of seven of our last school board directors, a supermajority of the city council, Senator Nancy Skinner, Supervisor Keith Carson, Mayor Eric Gein, the Alameda Labor Council, and a host of other unions and community leaders found at laurababbitt.com. Thank you for your time, consideration, and I would be honored to have your support as well. Thank you so much. Excellent. <laughs> I love that phone ringer. All right, um, I guess it's my turn now since uh, B is a, the next letter or still in the, the B. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Thousand Oaks Neighborhood Association for organizing this event. I'm actually just down the street from you guys, so not too far. 
looked at the neighborhood when I first uh, came to Berkeley, so love it. Um, great neighborhood. Uh, let me start by introducing myself a little bit. My name is Jose Luis Bedoya. I'm the parent of three kids at uh, Berkeley High, a, uh, a Berkeley Unified School District. I'm a, re a recent 2020 graduate, now studying in Santa Cruz, a sophomore in the IB program at BHS and a seventh grader at Longfellow. Look, I'm not a politician, I'm a parent. And I'm a parent that got fed up with the district's response to COVID-19. It's been anemic, it's been bad. My support is from parents and students from Berkeley. They have been texting, they have been calling, they have been sending emails. So I have a really uh, grassroots support. I don't want endorsements from the current board because I think they've done a terrible job. I haven't sought it and I don't want it. I have been part of BSEP as a school rep for the high school, but I had a chance to ensure that the music program as well as many other world programs had the money they needed to continue their enrichment classes. I'm also in the disaster and fire uh, commission and through my lived experience, I can see the, the possibilities and pitfalls. Look, um, I, my ba professional background is running Fortune 500 companies. I've uh, been part of those. I've started both nonprofits and startups. And I'm running because, you know, I want to pay it forward. It's time for us to, my generation, our generation, to step up and take the reins of this, these kinds of things that are happening. So, um, again, uh, you know, my platform is very simple. It's equity-based decision-making, academic excellence, and accountability. These are the things that I've been sorely missing in our discussion and our discourse with the uh, district. And I, that's something I wanna bring back. I wanna bring back a sense of governance from a professional perspective at the board and throughout the district so we can change the culture and bring give back to the students they, the, the, the attention and the need that they have in this time of COVID-19. Thank you so much. Michael. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks for meeting with me. Um, I'm the proud parent of three kids in the district, a eighth grader at King, um, uh, a sophomore at Berkeley High School, and actually a recent 2020 Berkeley High School grad who's now attending UC Davis at her home in her bedroom, of course. Um, so uh, I've, my wife and I have uh, really enjoyed um, uh, uh, the education system and meeting our friends through Berkeley. Um, we've been active Berkeley Unified volunteers for more than 10 years. We have four more years, five more years to go, actually. Um, I was a vice president of the executive board at Berkeley Arts Magnet. Um, I'm running a four school board because I believe that Berkeley can establish a national model for an equitable, fully funded, world-class education. Um, I'm also a 16-year attorney uh, in the uh, U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, where I uh, remedy the type of uh, compliance policies and procedures that are important to running school districts. Uh, I've uh, implemented hundreds of such cases across the state of California and many more in other states um, to resolve issues of uh, sexual harm, uh, hostile climate, disability access, um, race disparities. I'm also a lecturer in ethnic studies at UC Berkeley and legal studies and a commissioner with the city's police review commission focusing on designing policy to mitigate race-based disparities in policing. Um, I would like to bring my public service commitment to the next level by serving on the school board and working towards a more equitable community. In particular, I wanna bring forth a restorative justice program properly staffed and centralized and coordinated uh, to address equity and quality issues and also to uh, ensure uh, full public funding of public schools by advocating for uh, to start a housing trust for affordable housing for Berkeley school teachers and classified staff to live in Berkeley if they so choose to. And also finally to support a uh, ethnic studies curriculum that's based in mm -hmm. restorative justice. Thank you. You're up, Norma. Um, yeah, a comrade wrote back to me after reading what I had sent about my campaign, saying that she couldn't quite support my campaign. She's been a teacher for a long time. She can't because I'm not arguing for schooling to be corrected. Similarly, I'm not arguing for capitalism to be corrected. School, capitalism, they're of a piece. And even if we have a socialist revolution tomorrow, we, like our revolutionary allies throughout the world, 
would still be using extant social forms just with a better discussion, better rulership, the same way that Cuba is struggling to build socialism or that the US kept trying to, but given the interference from the Imperium, found that it couldn't make it and now it's trying again. Think Venezuela with Hugo. It needed elected support to move in the communist direction. And that went on for the 13 years that Hugo was in office. People kept getting elected more and more because the positions and ideas and actions people started being able to eat because of the progression of the intention, people signed on one way and another and also got elected to positions in the government. And of course that's driving the United States out of its mind, the US and the Imperium along with it. So now I am again a candidate in the November, on the November ballot for the Berkeley School Board. I've done this five other, six other times, well, or whatever, five or six other times. And I've gotten uh, almost, well, over 10% of the vote, in one case, 18%, which means it's very significant as far as I'm concerned, because you'll see what I have to say is not conventional. It is, I, I hope, however, helpful for you people and you can contact me with the information that you get through my uh, papers that I submit with you. Thank you, Norma. Next up is Esfandia. Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for the time and the opportunity. I'm Esfandia Rimani. I'm a proud parent of three daughters uh, who attended K through 12 uh, Berkeley Public Schools. The oldest one is doing her PhD at Cal and the uh, middle one at uh, junior at Cal and the youngest one just graduated from Berkeley High School and she's helping out with my campaign as a campaign manager. So I'm a first generation immigrant. I came here when I was 17. Uh, my parents and siblings were left behind because of revolution and war. You know, I worked and supported myself through college. I attended at Cal. This is where I met my wife. We both uh, received our undergrad and graduate degrees at Cal. So both uh, my wife and I are products of public schools and we love and we believe in uh, public education. So that's why we had no hesitation to enrolling our three daughters into the uh, Berkeley Public Schools. Over the past 20 years, I've been involved hands-on in numerous aspects of Berkeley school system. I was a BSEP uh, committee member. I was a PNO uh, committee member. I've volunteered in different uh, PTAs. I, in, during the pandemic, I'm volunteering, helping delivering food to schools, with uh, helping with the ed hub, and uh, even giving back to the community in other aspects. I volunteer in the youth shelter, uh, homeless shelter, and um, even globally. I go past four years. I've gone to a Greece refugee camp, volunteering my time helping the refugees over there. So you know, while my family and I had positive experience with Berkeley school system. We also witnessed firsthand serious issues with the system. That's, and that's why I want to give back and want to help out with the system. Sexual harassment and abuses and the safety is a big item in my platform. Also, um, achievement gaps and the racial inequality and biases. Of course, I want to address the climate, existential climate crisis in our Berkeley school system too. Professionally, I have led projects worth several hundred millions of dollars dealing with budgeting, negotiation, building alliance among various stakeholders. With my professional expertise in risk management, I will bring pragmatic solutions and approaches dealing with root cause of issues and come up with early preventive measures, which would cost a lot less than trying to deal with symptoms in late stage. Thank you very much. I appreciate your introduction. Thank you. Next up, Anna. Well, thank you Thousand Oaks Neighborhood Association for hosting this great forum. My name is Anna Vasudev and I'm a candidate for Berkeley School Board. I'm a proud mother of two boys enrolled in Berkeley Public Schools and an equity PTA leader. I'm a first generation college graduate who grew up in a Nicaraguan immigrant family. I was able to thrive in schools because of the support of community-based organizations like El Instituto Familiar de la Raza. I know firsthand that all our children can reach their full potential just like I did with the right support systems in place. 
As an active Berkeley parent, I have fought for our students by advocating alongside the Berkeley Federation of Teachers to ensure that our schools are better funded. By partnering with Walk Bike Berkeley to pass Vision Zero to keep our children safe on their way to and from school. By serving as your Vice President of Equity and Inclusion on the Berkeley PTA Council to give families of color more of a voice in the decision-making processes for our schools. As a professional Safe Routes to School leader, I currently oversee a district-wide program to ensure that 55,000 children can get to school safely. I bring practical government experience and strong fiscal management skills to this position. As a member of the school board, I will continue to fight to close the opportunity gap for our most vulnerable students, including African-American learners, Latinx students, and students with disabilities. I will fight so that our educators can make a living wage. My mom was an educator and I know how hard they work. I will advocate for safe, affordable, and sustainable transportation for our students. Lastly, I'm the only candidate endorsed by the entire current school board and also have the endorsement of the Alameda County Democratic Party, the Berkeley Federation of Teachers, the Berkeley Council of Classified Employees, Senator Nancy Skinner, Mayor Jesse Arreguin, the Supermajority of City Council, the Alameda Labor Council, and many other organizations and elected officials. Please visit my website at anavasudio.org to learn more about my campaign. Mil gracias, Thousand Oaks. Thank you all very much. Thanks for sticking to the time. And if you're having any problems seeing uh, <clears throat> Martha uh, hold up, holding up the signs, please let us know. Uh, the first question, uh, we're going to shuffle up the order a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask um, Jose if you would be willing to answer this question first, but this is a question posed to all of the candidates tonight. What do you see as the main challenges to providing equitable educational experiences to our diverse population during this period of distance learning, and how can they be addressed? Uh, thanks. Uh, that's a good question. That's actually one of the reasons that I'm running as I dug in a little bit into, um, you know, I had a little bit more time and dug into the COVID-19 situation. I looked at the uh, Vision 2020 plan and saw that basically it hasn't lived up to its, you know, its own standard, its own goals, its own plan. You know, it's been a failure for short of uh, other words. And so for me, I think that, you know, it seems like this is something that's not just in the last four years, it's something that's been in, eight, in the, maybe in the last eight years, it's something that's ongoing. A couple of folks before me who have taken their kids through Berkeley High School have expressed the same thing. I think part of the will, uh, part of the reason is twofold and maybe a threefold, but let's start with a couple of two. One is planning. So there's a lot of discussions about, you know, hey, we wanna do X and we, we set up these goals, but don't have the funding to follow it. I'll give you an example. So. My, uh, uh, my daughter was in the two-way immersion program. That got consolidated very haphazardly. The parents were not told anything and got uh, put into Longfield. What happened was basically yeah, all the students were shoved there, over there, but no, no, none of the resources actually followed. Bad planning, bad uh, outreach to parents. Uh, so that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing, of course, is a political will and culture. I think that there's a lot of lofty goals that we in Berkeley set up for ourselves, but there's a lack of follow through. There's not a culture of actually doing, there's a cultural of aspirations, but uh, you know, I'm one of the candidates that have experience in actually getting things done. If you have a Toyota car, you probably have some of the products and designs in your car right now, I can get it done. Thank you very much. And I forgot to remind folks that we're, for the questions, it's a minute and a half. So thank you, Jose, for sticking that, to that. Uh, Espandir, can you uh, step up as the next uh, speaker responding to that question? Thanks, David. Would you mind repeating the question again, just to be- Absolutely. Uh, so what do you see as the main challenges to providing equitable educational experiences for our diverse population during this period of distance learning and how can those challenges be addressed? Great. Thank you so much. Excellent question. And this is a um, challenge, no matter what distance learning or in-person learning. And, um, you know, again, I also agree that uh, Vision 22 has been a failure. The name is nice, Vision 2020, but the, uh, the deliverable and result has been awful. So whether, uh, if you bring it to current, the distance learning, definitely we wanna make sure it's equity, is uh, it's there for all students, but overall, when we're dealing with issues, my approach is looking for the undesired income, undesired uh, results uh, and outcome, and how we can avoid that. 
uh, through a risk management perspective. So what are the key drivers that could take things uh, in the wrong way? And Vision 2020 and Achievement Gap is a good example. Uh, the school board and the school system has been reactionary instead of finding the root cause of the issue. And uh, same thing uh, during the distance learning. Uh, I believe we can use the technology and we can use uh, to improve that, but uh, you have to really segment and identify which groups need the help uh, and act accordingly. Sorry, I, I don't see Marta and I don't know where I'm with the timing. So I would appreciate if uh, I know. Uh, 15 seconds left. Awesome. No, again, my, my general approach, like I said, is uh, early, detection, early uh, mitigations, and preventive measures. Thank you. Next up, Michael. Thank you. As a federal enforcement attorney with jurisdiction over school districts, I've implemented hundreds of compliance and remedies uh, resolution agreements for school districts across the state of California and in other states. Um, this is something that's exactly in my wheelhouse that I can bring to the district and provide uh, legal and also best practices support. Um, during shelter in place, this is one of our most challenging times um, and uh, is frankly an exigency in terms of equity. Um, if we are not careful and we don't focus on compliance and regulatory concerns that are required by law and I think are structured in the proper way to ensure that all students receive equitable outcomes, if we lose our eyesight on that and lose the ball on this, um, it can result in generational uh, deficits and exacerbation of existing problems. So um, I believe that number one, you need to focus on the legal compliance issues. And in particular with sex harassment and sex harm, these are problems that have been ongoing for some time that I've watched at a distance because I am recused from uh, looking at cases within a school district. Um, if I, I'm on the board, I will be able to directly help the district to address these issues for a prompt and effective response. Also, um, uh, African-American students are 6.1 times more likely to be suspended and expelled in, in Berkeley versus white students. White students are 1.7 times more likely to take an AP class than black students. This is an example of the opportunity gap. And there are things that we can put in place through a robust and properly staffed restorative justice program to address these issues, which I have implemented in other school districts successfully. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norma. You are up next. Right. Uh, my intention with this campaign is to use the office to let come before us the contradiction that U.S. institutions like those throughout the world are retaining and advancing efforts to continue subjugation of populations de facto enslavement. The U.S. Imperium takes control to of what's on earth that nations of people are living on. These products gleaned and produced by people have unfortunately been termed resources meant to serve few man's profiteering as well as adding to advancement of society. School is one of those controlling institutions. As the colonized mass that we are, we, the 99%, have to be indoctrinated to accept, know, to love our de facto enslavement. So we go to school. We go to what a 13-year-old child explained is free compulsory education. I've described numerous details about this in my writings. I hope you get to see them. I'm also up on the League of Women Voters Voters Edge, you get a chance. One of those factors is that we are all teachers and students all our lives, yet the education commodity is snatched from us. This is the greatest sorrow, the alienation we endure. It's got to be over time. Stop, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Anna, you're up next. Great, thank you. I think, you know, right now during the time of COVID-19, the only difference is that our equity gaps have just exacerbated, right? Like many of our equity gaps are the same as they were before the pandemic. But I think, you know, there's a couple of, as someone who works overseeing a district-wide program for SFUSD, 
think what we're seeing is a couple of new challenges that have come up. Like we still don't have enough um, Wi-Fi for our students. Our, our students don't have enough like hotspots. So very like practical short-term solutions like trying to advocate for public Wi-Fi for our students would go a long way. I would say at, at the very short term, look at what other cities have done to kind of close the opportunity gaps a bit um, during the pandemic. Like in San Francisco where I work, we have these community learning hubs which were you know, essentially childcare for or ch children of essential workers. We're seven months into the pandemic and we don't have childcare for our essential workers, right? That's unacceptable because those are the most, usually like the families with the most vulnerable students, right? So I think trying to address those short-term opportunity gaps that are being exacerbated by the pandemic and also continuing to focus on long-term opportunity gaps that continue to exist. There was an update in December on the 2020 vision and guess what? Our African-American learners, our Latinx students and our students with disabilities are still falling behind. So making sure that we have a new iteration with strong evaluation as a professional who oversees district-wide program, I can't emphasize enough how much strong evaluation is needed so that these frameworks are not just rhetoric. They're every year we have an annual report and we can see, okay, this is how we've addressed the opportunity gaps for this population and really on an annual basis, evaluate if our tactics are working or not, right? Districts have scarce resources. We need to have stronger evaluation in place to make sure that we're successful and that we're addressing the needs of our most vulnerable students. And okay, I don't thank, you much. Much, thank you. <laughs> Laura, you are up next. And I just wanna uh, say, by the way, sometime this evening, I will inadvertently forget to include someone. I've done it the previous two nights of our forum, so please do not take offense if I screw up tonight, because undoubtedly I will. I'm human. Thank you, Laura. Please. So the question was around the main challenges for um, distance learning and having equitable results. And I would say in response to uh, COVID-19, we're finally doing what the community has been asking for years. Uh, I was a leader of Parents of Children of African Descent. And during that time, we partnered with uh, Supervisor Keith Carson's office because we knew there was a digital divide. We knew there were many students who didn't have uh, computers at home or low cost or free Wi-Fi access. So during that partnership, we actually gave 100 computers out to students, uh, access to the internet, um, but the district didn't pick that up and keep that going. That's part of why I'm running. We've also have, have had advocates who've been telling the district about outdoor classrooms and creating green schoolyards and how we responded years ago uh, with that effort, not because of COVID-19, but because the data says that students learn better outside and there are so many other benefits to that outdoor learning environment. We would have also been in a better position uh, parents and families who've needed uh, ways to attend school meetings uh, via Zoom or any other kind of link or conference call chat for years, that technology has been available, but yet we have not implemented it. So um, hopefully one of the good things that will come out of this is we will have closed the digital divide. Our teachers will have more technological uh, savvy with Google Classroom, parents more ways to keep up with where their children are and um, continue to to do all that we need to do to close the opportunity gap. Thank you so much. Thank you all. The second question is really uh, along a similar lines, but specifically, um, how can you provide support for working parents as well as teachers during this time of remote learning? So specifically focusing on, on what we can do to support those two uh, parts of the, of the school community. Uh, and we're gonna start with Michael. Thank you. Um, in terms of return to school, it's important to lead with the science. And, and that's something that I keep as a principal in mind. And of course, there are um, multiple stakeholders here, in particular with teachers who are employees. Um, I'm an active uh, union member of the American Federation of Teachers and also the American Federation of Government Employees. And uh, these are certainly important stakeholders to consider and uh, hear. Um, I think that there are ways to support uh, uh, working parents and also uh, teachers during this time that uh, have been raised uh, here as well, such as um, providing um, uh, services even during shelter in place uh, and considering um, uh, child care, uh, you know, with appropriate shelter, uh, uh, shelter in place based uh, health guidelines uh, to provide um, in addition, one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, uh, support for uh, students uh, as necessary, whether it be for those with accommodations based upon disability, but with 
regard to parents, uh, working parents, this is a really kind of a, a bleeding edge of the whole dialogue across the United States. Different school districts have started opening up um, and some of them are finding uh, uh, spikes in coronavirus. So I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, opening up too much or too fully without a phased return um, and uh, shifting back to a circumstance where we have to shut down again. That's not going to do anybody any help. Um, but I think targeted supports uh, for uh, those who are working parents and in particular students with disabilities, uh, their families need a lot of support um, and providing uh, access to uh, these through uh, perhaps one-on-one -on -one in a very limited setting. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, next up is Anna. Yes, can you repeat the question again? Absolutely. How can you provide support for working parents as well as teachers during this time of remote learning? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we really need to get our emergency childcare situation in place. There's a lot to figure out around schools reopening. And as someone who's working actively, I'm like my agency's contact person on schools reopening in San Francisco because the transportation system won't open unless 55,000 kids have to travel across the city to go to school. So this is something I work on very intimately, but what other districts have done is they've, they've come up with things like the community learning hubs in San Francisco to create a space for children of essential workers to go to. I think right now with our classified, like at a very you know concrete level with our classified union, there's been a negotiation around an MOU that's been finalized. I think there's an opportunity to potentially bring back some after school programming that would help parents. Um, but again, like, I don't know if, if that means like more distance learning programming, if that's necessarily going to help parents. I know that there's funding in place. I hosted a, a, a discussion with our mayor, Jesse Arreguin, about three weeks ago, and I know that the city has funding in place for emergency child care, but it's become very hard to find the, the staff and the labor who's willing to go and work, right? And so I think that there are real negotiations that need to happen between the school district and the city, and we need to stop working in silos, work more collaboratively, and figure out emergency childcare as soon as possible. Our parents need it, our teachers need it, our essential workers need it. So that's that's my um, quick answer to that very complicated question. Thank you very much. Norma, you are up next. Would you like me to repeat the question? Or are you ready to go? No, um, you know, I'm reading from my material because I have certain things I wanna convey among us. And so I'll continue doing that. I began my studies to qualify to do school teaching in 1959. I became licensed having completed four years of college study in 1963. Until 20 years ago, I held various and many teaching and conduct uh, positions and conducting students activities at one, well, I'm not gonna read that one, uh, people, Students and parents and teachers were never able to attain structures that felt satisfactory. Thus the constant insistence on reform. Refo <laughs> it's like you can't fix capitalism, you can't fix the school under capitalism. Reform has not yet in 180 years of it provided satisfactory schooling. Various understandings, including intensive and constant research and experience suddenly enlightened me. I was overcome with the recognition that it is school itself that is the problem. The institution requires the overall eradication of the person who attends and of their family. Both are obligated to become an other in order to fit the requirements school has in order to meet the design, the demands of this social system to provide submission to a de facto slavery system that provides profit, wealth, and power. Thanks. Thanks, Norma. Laura, you are up next. So the question was around working support, uh, support for working parents and our teachers during COVID-19 to support distance learning. And I would say that we definitely need proactive leadership on our school board, which is why I'm running for, <laughs> for office right now, because uh, we should be further along with our phase reentry plans. We should be further along with how we could at least start uh, providing these needs for our earliest learners, as well as for our teachers and our classified staff. Um, and so 
you can reopen schools safely. I've reopened offices around the world. We've put in all the practices in place recommended by the CDC and we've had no outbreaks. So it's definitely possible, but we don't really have project owners. We don't have project managers. We don't have real updates since March. We've June, since July. Um, and the community has been asking for this kind of support. We are grateful that we have family engagement specialists and officers who are connecting uh, parents with each other um, so that we can create pods, so that we can do what the community has always done and supported each other during these times. Uh, the city does have programs right now that um, a lot of people are able to put their children in uh, to help with this remote learning because they still have to work away from the home. Uh, so again, as a school, we need to do more to make sure that we are um, on track so that as our numbers decline for COVID, we're ready to re-enter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Fandira? Thank you. I believe in any uh, circumstances, you can't really address anything till you are able to measure the scope of the problem. Same as in this case. So the first thing I would do, like uh, try to, um, based on data, uh, analyze like what is the scope of issue here? How many of the 30,000 or so students need this uh, assistance? Are they all equally needed this? And then try to you know, prioritize based on that. And um, having said that, I would definitely resort to Office of uh, Family Engagement and Equity and uh, try to use the resources and leverage those that we have, bring, uh, reach out to the families, see uh, where they are with this issue, how much help do they need. I believe I, I, I helped my wife who's a pediatrician in the uh, local community with the uh, nonprofit organization teaching and tutoring kids. So we, we know how to approach the families and uh, help them feel more comfortable. Also, I believe that we should bring a lot of flexibility for some of these families that are definitely in need and they're, have, they're going through some challenges. Thank you very much. Jose Luis. Okay, so I think um, the question is working parents, teachers, and I would add essential workers because I think those are the folks that are actually taking the brunt of this COVID-19, especially in the Latinx community where you have you know, a high index of um, infection. But let, let's start with a couple of things. One is, um, you know, what I what I would do, I would provide tools. So parents are very resourceful, resourceful, resourceful if I can get that out, and provide the uh, necessary tools for whether in IT, whether it be IT software training or other things like uh, work groups or, or co-teaching pods that they can organize on their on their own. But let me say a couple of things. One of the reasons that we're facing this and it's so bad is because you know it's a lack of planning. I started this whole argument with one of the reasons I got involved is a lack of planning, the lack of execution at uh, BUSD. If you look at it in comparison to what LA uh, district, the district the LA Unified has done, they are beginning to their reopening process with 700,000 kids. But once again, 700,000 kids. We at Berkeley are much smaller. And this kind of impact is impacting, this kind of thing is infecting and impacting you know, people, uh, parents, specifically women who are leaving their careers behind, who are leaving uh, you know, a lot of things behind so that they can actually take care of these things, become part-time teacher, become part IT person, become all these kinds of things. We need to give the, the parents the tools that are necessary so that they can do this kind of job so that they don't have necessarily have to leave their jobs and, and uh, their productive uh, endeavors. So I think that part of the issue for me is planning. And I will continue to help uh, people do that. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move on to question three. Again, it's sort of, all of these are sort of connected but taking sort of a slightly different approach. So um, as you know, uh, we've just got an announcement that there's the um, possibility of elementary schools, K, uh, uh, K through five, PK through five opening up, but they have to pass certain um, measures that show that they're ready. So the question is, what do you think the conditions need to be for full opening of schools? And how do you feel about the elementary schools potentially reopening on the October 13th? And we're gonna start with Norma. Oh, good. Because I'm, I'm coming away from the prepared material. I think sending children to school under this circumstance is madness. 
uh, we're told that that's, it's good for the child. They can't do anything but go. However, you know that uh, subsidy that our government has been debating for the past three or four months that our president said, we're not going to debate it until after the election, right? The, the, the pay so that people can stay home uh, is not gonna be available, hasn't been available and won't ever be enough because that's the way the system works. Children should not have to go to school in there until we get a handle on that virus, which we don't have as everybody here knows. Um, so the system <laughs> is providing help for wealthy and powerful people. And I told you, Casey Gerald on an interview with um, Van Jones said, you have to give up a piece of yourself in order to participate in what's expected of us all. Uh, that's what the wars and the school tests have always been. If you're going to go be a soldier for this uh, structure, <laughs> you have to go kill people. Thank you, Norma, I appreciate it. Uh, back to you, Jose Luis, do you want me to repeat the question? Sure. Okay. What do you think the conditions need to be for full opening of the schools and how do you feel about elementary schools potentially reopening on October 13th, TK through fifth? Well, thank you for that. Um, it's something that I feel very strongly about and I've uh, maybe lost votes when I've said that this has to be science-based, has to be planned and it has to be orderly. None of those conditions really are evident in the announcement that the Berkeley Unified School District recently made. I can't remember if it was today or yesterday, but they made this plan. They have a little bit of a dashboard where they said, well, you know, we have to follow the Ottawa County, you know, uh, uh, feedback in terms of how to open, when to open. Uh, but if you look at what we are doing or we're purportedly doing versus what LA County is doing, they're, they're, they're thinking of testing every child. They're thinking of testing every teacher. They're thinking about testing every administrator and they have it in the press release. We are thinking of about just testing perhaps the teachers and perhaps the administrators. Um, I don't feel good about that. I think it leaves a huge amount of risk for us as parents and, and, uh, and, and as our, our students and for our students to be kind of a guinea pig. I feel not great until actually we can, act, we can test, we can prove that it's going well, we can prove that it's repeatable and at this point, it's, we're not there. So I don't think that we're gonna get there by October 16th. I think it's foolhardy to push um, on that issue because it's just not gonna be ready. If I were elected to the board member, which I hope I will be, I will make sure that the planning is not as atrocious as it currently is, leaving all of us basically holding the bag. We pay lots of taxes. We are very responsible folks by and large, and yet we get this kind of a result in our you know, supposed experts. I hope to make this better when I get to the board. Thank you. Anna, you are up next. Yeah, it's a great question and something that is very much in my wheelhouse since I have professional experience being my agency's contact for schools reopening in San Francisco. And I can tell you, if you look at the dashboard, and I'm glad that Jose Luis brought this up, if you look at the dashboard where my wheelhouse is professional, professionally is in this category called school campus logistics, no district has figured out in the nine Bay Area counties what the logistics should be for reopening schools. If you look at our completion rates on where we are on the dashboard, it's 25% for arrival and departures, 25% for transportation. That's my wheelhouse. That's what I'm supposed to do, figure out how our students are, 55,000 kids are going to get back in SFUSD. It's very complicated, right? So I think on the logistics front, we're not ready, but we need to invest more time in figuring out logistics planning. We need to learn from the private schools, which will likely be the first ones to go back because they have a smaller scale of students right like if you look at the when the waivers were when people were applying to waivers private schools were being granted waivers right a handful of them but their population size is very small and I think districts need to learn from what private schools are doing there's a lot of things on the logistical side that need to be figured out we also need to understand the concerns from our labor partners right like how many teachers actually want to go back how many teachers feel safe going back how many of them live in areas where maybe they're not in the red and they're commuting from east oakland or other areas that have higher covid risks right there's a lot that still needs to be figured out and ironed out before schools open and i think you know bringing that practical skill set as someone who's overseeing you know response for schools reopening at the sfmta will be huge for our district and i can't wait to serve because 
this is a district where my boys are going to school, right? Like I love my work in San Francisco. I'm very excited to serve the district where my two boys are going to school. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, you are up next. Thank you. I have expertise in this area as a federal government compliance attorney. Uh, we are watching this issue very, very closely. We have a national team monitoring uh, coronavirus related uh, cases and complaints associated with access, in particular with uh, disability access is a main issue of concern. Um, I am a subject matter expert in the area of web accessibility online, and this is an area of high concern, of course. Um, this is a very complex question uh, for the district. It's not an easy type of thing to uh, resolve quickly. And there are many stakeholders, in, including uh, labor, that are very important to listen to. Um, my feeling is that if you look at small colleges such as Colby College, I went to a small college before I went to uh, uh, Cal's Ethnic Studies program and then went to UCLA Law. Um, Colby College is apparently managing this very well but they're also a private school that's very, very small. And they're doing, uh, I believe, twice weekly uh, tests and also uh, very tightly controlled uh, quarantining in terms of campus. These campuses are small, the populations are small, the faculty stay on campus in general, and they're getting tested and they're doing tracing very, very often. If you look at other countries where they're doing this with schools as well, um, you need these practices in place. So the medical science has to lead uh, you need to have, number one, uh, testing in place, robust testing, probably twice a week, and tracing, which we just don't have right now. Um, and in addition, you want to know which faculty or teachers are even interested in going into teach. And those are, will be the ones you would ask to perhaps consider a phased uh, uh, return for just some limited of the most uh, needy of students, in particular students with disabilities. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you. Laura, you are up next. Thank you. Can you please re repeat the question? Absolutely. What do you think the conditions need to be for full opening of schools? And how do you feel about elementary schools potentially reopening on October 13th, TK through fifth grade? Well, unfortunately, there's no way that BOSD is actually ready to open on October 13th. Um, I wish I could say that they were. and. For them to be ready, they would have had to have uh, implemented the guidelines that the CDC is asking us for. For example, uh, can we do the contact tracing? They haven't even identified what students are even willing to go back, what parents are even willing to send their students back to classroom. Uh, we have no idea on how we're going to do the testing, uh, which is extremely important. Um, we didn't invest in outdoor classrooms, even though we have uh, parents in our school district who create model outdoor classrooms and the science is extremely good about uh, low impact rates and how they keep people safe and they have all the sanitation that we need and are required to do. So it's very unfortunate that we aren't able to meet the needs for any of our students right now because we haven't done what we need to do and um, following those CDC guidelines are important for me. And understanding that is not about my opinion, but it's also about listening to our constituents. I have uh, parents of kindergartners who say their kids are running away from the computer. I have parents who say their kids are getting totally turned off from school altogether. They are depressed. Um, they are need, in need of more social emotional support. They are crying. It's like torture uh, right now in this environment. And so we do need to give people the options, but we also have to follow the science to, be, to even be able to give them that option. And so that's why I'm running for school board. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Espandier. Thank you. I'll try to answer your second part of the question first and hopefully answer the first part too. So uh, short answer is no, I, I don't agree with the opening of school because uh, this is a safety issue, public concern issue, and uh, to me it's a risk management issue. And I don't see the data or uh, any indication that justify the opening of schools at this time, right? So to me, the safety and well-being of students and teachers and stakeholders at utmost. And it's unfortunate, it's unprecedented time uh, that we are in this uh, environment right now. But uh, for, a, for this to work, we want to make sure that the control systems are in place, that the testing, we have resources for testing, for tracing, and we have contingency plan. 
And we cannot just um, uh, play a game uh, with this issue, hoping that uh, you know, it would uh, make life easier for some folks for bringing the kids back to school because all it takes, and again, safety of one individual is a lot more important than that, uh, that uh, convenience to me. So I would definitely leave it to the experts, public uh, health experts on this material and uh, um, hopefully we'll get to that point when we have all the resources to do this. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. We're gonna uh, move on to question number four. We're at 7.51 and amazingly that's just one minute over. So thank you all for keeping to the time schedule. I appreciate that. Um, and we're gonna start with Anna. What is your opinion of having police presence in the school, specifically Ber Berkeley High, especially when we return to on-campus learning? A great question. So as part of Safe Routes to School, I have fought hard to make sure that we implement a restorative justice model as part of how we deal with gang violence on our buses, right, in San Francisco. I think um, police don't have a presence in our school. I feel that SROs, if I, when you talk to them, right, like I work professionally in San Francisco, I have a relationship with the SROs in San Francisco, but there are many well-funded restorative justice programs that help support our students. I think we lack that in Berkeley. So I think, you know, we have one SRO at Berkeley High, and I understand he has an important, uh, you know, role in the community, but it's still a police, right? It's still police presence. I think what we need in Berkeley is to really rethink how we are handling our restorative justice program, fun, uh, have a better funded res restorative justice program that's comprehensive K to 12 and make sure that we have programs like SVIP in San Francisco, United Players in, uh, in my work, we have the Muni Transit Assistance Program, it's called MTAP, where we have, you know, former, uh, former, uh, you know, gang members come and they have gone through like a program where they're, they're trained in restorative justice now, and they're part of the community and they ride the buses to help protect students now, right? And so I think, when you invest like San Francisco has in comprehensive restorative justice models, you don't need police presence at schools. And in fact, if you work with the police and you talk to them like I do as part of my job, they tell you that they prefer restorative justice models over SROs handling situations with high schoolers. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, you're up next. Yes, thank you. Um, as a federal enforcement attorney, I've enforced uh, resolution agreements uh, at many large school districts and at dozens of smaller ones. Uh, addressing uh, restorative justice. Restorative justice is not a vanity uh, program, which is uh, part of the misperception around this. Um, it's a program that addresses equity and quality across race, sex, and disability in particular, and bullying in general. It, pro it promotes a safe and secure environment in schools uh, that can bring down, if it's done properly and staffed properly with appropriately trained RJ counselors, can bring down incidents of uh, sexual harm, but also it can reduce suspensions and expulsions that are unnecessary by using diversionary uh, uh, best practices of de-escalation uh, to bring wholeness to uh, the student and to the classroom environment. An SRO, uh, while that's not directly a police officer, um, that's actually a law enforcement officer. I've put in place MOUs with school districts to either remove SROs or to highly regulate their use Instead of SROs in Berkeley Unified, I would like to see counselors and more counselors that are properly trained, that are tied to policies and procedures that address um, notification of alleged sexual harm and then prompt and effective responses tied in with a Title IX coordinator and investigator. And in addition, uh, opportunities for the teachers to be able to teach. So if they put in place a certain discipline matrix and the students um, are not, or the student is having a bad day, is not able to manage their uh, behavior, um, then that student can go to a counselor and have a moment with that counselor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jose Luis. Uh, let me answer your question directly and then maybe get to a couple of comments. Um, police have zero roles in schools, period. Um, if we have police in our schools, it just is a further indictment of the failures that we have in the district. It means that we have failed our kids to teach them early on in third grade when there seems to be a disparity of school grades or scores overall. It seems to be a continuous you know, failure to, you know, or lack of alarm at eighth grade when the math scores 
become a gigantic gulf and it's a failure when you know we see the results in high school and say look there's all these issues well there's all these issues because we didn't pay attention so those are a couple of comments um and a couple other comments as well um first of all we why would we have police in an environment where even berkeley's thinking about defunding the police it makes no sense we're kind of a, of two minds we're saying on the one hand we want to have more police on, on campus. On the other hand, we don't want police interference in our day-to-day -day life. It's a juxtaposition that's just unbelievable to me. I think we should spend that money that we have and move it to other services and move it to an earlier age and move it to de-escalation classes or teaching you know, our kids how to deal with their social and emotional issues and deal with the underlying issues that lead to bad behavior or not acceptable behavior within the classroom. Those are the things that we need to spend money. We don't need to spend money on actual, actually having people who can actually, who oftentimes carry guns or oftentimes have weapons of some sort within our classroom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Espandia. Thank you for the question. I also disagree with having a SRO or police in a, a high school or any level of the schools. Um, with no disrespect to the person who is staffed for that role, he might, he or she might be doing a great job, but the concept, I'm against it. Then, uh, you know, I've been to countries and I'm from a country that unfortunately militarized the colleges and school, and I don't wanna see that here, definitely not in Berkeley. Um, and uh, this is another issue, like if it's still earlier, the uh, earlier age of school system, uh, we don't have to have policies in high school. Uh, what's next? Having policies in uh, middle school or elementary school or kindergarten? So that's not the solution. Again, the resources can be spent better educating and training, providing the right training to our own administrator to be able to help. Uh, recent studies showed like uh, across the United States, not just Berkeley, that 80% of the uh, counselors are not really trained to deal with uh, this uh, safety and sexual harassment issues. So we need to spend uh, training and money in those resources. Um, thank you. Norma? No way can a teacher teach to each child, to each child's willingness, nor to their ability, nor to their interests, all of which change or stay the same over time from day to day, hour to hour, or not at all, depending. Not if they have 20 children or five or even just the one or two. I've been reading a book with a group, a group called Strike Debt, D-E-B-T, trying to fight the stupid, horrible debts. You know, we, as capital, uh, subjects of a capitalist system, that's the big thing, we live with, with debt. Um, and, one of the book is called The Deficit Myth. And what this economist is telling us is that the push of a button would afford everybody sufficient funds. The funds are there to let us do what we need to do with our lives in this crisis or any time. An example that they give is World War II. They packed up everything and made it all work to fund the war, the war effort. They could do the same thing about the crisis. The money is there and can be given to us if we had legislators who want to take care of us, who want to let us take care of us. Thank you, Norma, I appreciate it. Laura, you're up next. Thank you so much. Can you please repeat the question just because I don't think yeah, we've absolutely. gotten very clear answers to the question itself. What is your opinion on having a police presence in the school, specifically Berkeley High, when we do return to on-campus learning? Exactly, when we do return to on-campus uh, learning. And so all of these ideas are great. Having robust restorative justice is something that I advocated for, which uh, we implemented through our LCAP plan back in 2014. Um, having uh, community uh, resource officers is also something that I've advocated against when they wanted to um, expand the number of, of 
uh, SROs in Berkeley Unified School Districts, but who we have right now and what we have right now when we return back to schools is not broken. So let's not break what's not broken already. Uh, this man is a part of our school community. Our children show them his homework. We don't have any data which shows how many people he's kept out of the system, uh, but I know personally that he's kept families of, of all races out of the system because he knows their families. He's communicating to these students and he's being a mentor and a role model. So uh, let's not take the, uh, put the cart before the horse and do anything too drastic to uh, implement what's already working well in our school districts. And let's also not forget that we do have active shooters that come onto various campuses and uh, commit mass murders. And we need someone there who is, who is trained to deal with that kind of incident. God forbid it happens at Berkeley High School. And let's also not forget that our regular street Police, if called, throw our kids on the ground for jaywalking, especially African-American kids. And just last year, fourth and fifth grade boys who were relatives were having a fight and a Berkeley employee said, call the police on elementary school students. So we have serious issues we need to fix first before we just remove what's working. Thank you for allowing me to go over time, I apologize. Thank you. Um, we're actually doing pretty good. It's eight o'clock. Um, I'm going to have closing time, but I want to bring up one issue. You know, the, the COVID crisis has really dominated tonight's uh, conversation, not surprisingly. But I want to talk about something that was a real hot topic at Berkeley High School before COVID started, and that was the issue of the student movement around sexual allegations and specifically Title IX issues at Berkeley High and how they were or were not uh, properly enforced. Um, it's not a specific question. I just want to get um, a, a, a one and a half minute feedback from each of you about Berkeley High uh, sexual assault allegations, sexual assault and Title IX. Um, and I'm going to follow the order of question number one. So we're going to start with Jose Luis. I think we said a minute and a half, right? Correct. Okay, well, that's, um, that's unfortunately not enough time to talk about this topic because it's something that we could go on for days. Um, you know, earlier in the week, or is it last week, I can't remember anymore, we had a session with Berkeley High students, you know, some of the leadership of uh, this movement who had the, you know, asked us some very poignant questions. And they asked questions like, you know, how do we trust what you're saying and that you're going to follow through? And I said to them, well, you know, there's an old adage of, you know, trust but verify. And you can't trust all the adults. You can't trust that they're going to advocate for your issues. They don't see what you see. We don't see what you see as parents. So please continue to advocate for yourself, continue to push this issue. This issue is not going away. It's an old issue. It's an issue, it's a societal issue. It's an indictment of our, our society and how we you know, have managed to you know, not teach our young boys by and large, although you know, there are things in the other direction as well, but we have not taught our boys very well on how to man mind their manners. And that's unfortunate. Again, I told them that it's something that they need to continue to advocate. I think that they need to advocate from a social issue perspective, from a district perspective, and also to make sure that we actually obey the laws that are in place. And I'm sure Michael will talk about some of those issues later on, but it's something that councils, council needs to be very, very keen on. Otherwise, we are going to be in a heap of trouble later on. Thank you. Thank you. Espandiar? Yeah, thank you for actually bringing this question. You know, I have three daughters that went through the uh, Berkeley school system. The youngest one just finished, and she was telling me we could talk about this on a daily basis, which is totally horrific. Like talking about Team 1-5, Team 1-8, this horrendous act that the kids, these are supposed to be students behaving in the school. Having said that, you know, again, I believe in things being taken care of at the early stage. So the, the behavior of the students when they come to high school, they just don't show up overnight. So I truly believe if the education, the family are engaged and community engaged at the earlier stage, we don't have to deal with this issue at, at the, at the uh, high school level. We talk about restorative justice, true, it's very uh, good tool, but if it's meaningful, if it's meaningful, if the communications are transparent, if the expectations are set, if the consequences are set, if they're communicated to uh, students who are misbehaving and they know the what the consequences. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a zero tolerance 
when it comes to this kind of behavior, but at the same time, you have to understand the context of where these kids are coming from. And I want to do everything to help all the kids from, from the early stage of this process. This is a huge, for me, this is the number one item on my campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yes, this is also a top issue in my, uh, for my campaign on the board that I will address directly. Um, the law is there and it says prompt and effective response. Um, I'm a federal government enforcement attorney. I've put in place uh, remedies to resolve sex harassment and sex assault issues across districts and universities across California and in other states. This is a very important issue because what I've seen, although I'm recused from uh, Berkeley Unified cases, through talking to my kids, uh, my daughter, who is the committee chair, and also who was on YNG, which advocated on this issue. I also have spoken to uh, Stop Harassing, Berkeley Stop Harassing, and many others. But just seeing from the inside as a federal enforcement attorney, the district has not provided a prompt and effective response to notice of sexual harm. Um, there is plenty of advocacy going on to the degree that uh, a little bit less than a year ago, some female girl students felt so desperate that they wrote up the names of alleged sexual assaulters on a bathroom wall, and then this was posted up to social networking. Uh, this is of high concern from a compliance perspective. Uh, from the perspective of a federal attorney who sees this, it suggests that the school district has let the wheels fall off the bus, so to speak. Um, this is something that requires not only a restorative justice program, but integration of a restorative justice program into a fully staffed Title IX a uh, coordinator and investigator uh, system, along with training that includes administrators and teachers so that there's a fully knitted program that is coordinated by an associate superintendent and has a backing of the superintendent. It's a matter of priority. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Norma. Uh, school is a bad place to force anyone to go regardless those so-called moments of pleasure and learning there. It, I tell people a lot, uh, we all hate school. Most of them go uh, agree with me, but uh, some of them go, oh no, I loved school. Well, that's selective amnesia. That's how we behave. It's just a customary kind of thing of trying to keep ourselves in good order. We all do that constantly. But life's difficulties are magnified by the burdens we're required to shoulder in this oppressive society. Yes, like school, that we don't want to go, but have to in order to get a job, in order to fit in and such. Let's let have people live integrated uh, instead of denying <laughs> or learning. People learn from the last months in the womb until death. People need to teach each other all of these things. The teaching is a joy and we miss that. It's become a chore that has to be imposed on people. I am a deep communist. I am third generation communist and I uh, participate with Peace and Freedom Party which is on the ballot for socialism in California. These are all ideas that come out of liberating us from having to be the slaves of our owners. Thank you, Norma, I really appreciate it. Anna, you're up next. Hey, David, can you repeat the question again? Absolutely. So um, the question was, uh, before COVID started, there was a student-led movement uh, around the issue of sexual harassment at Berkeley High School, which has not been an issue just recently, but it's been ongoing, and specifically around issues of Title IX and Title IX enforcement and coordination. Um, and do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, so first off, I the fact that this continues to be an issue is terrible, right? Like our district should have figured out a way how to, how to solve this a lot earlier. I would say that I, in, as many of the comments before, um, I also support the hiring of a Title IX coordinator and that was on the list of demands for the students. Before the pandemic hit, as part of the PTA Council, so I'm the VP of Equity and Inclusion on the PTA Council, we had VHS Stop Harassing come and visit and we heard from the students directly and we put together a working group, right, with parents and students. So it had some teeth. 
um, to say like, hey, why don't we organize around consent education at the K to 12 level? And there was a great presentation at the PTSA for Berkeley High right before the pandemic. And we found a provider called Shalom Bayi that had a, a comprehensive consent education model that the students at BHS Stop Harassing really liked too. And so I think we need to pick up that momentum that you know happened right before the pandemic because it's there's no excuse not to do it and figure out a way to do this online if distance learning continues for the rest of the year we can't wait just until we go back into the classroom what i've learned about in recent conversations with bhs stop harassing is that the harassment is manifesting itself online in in breakout groups in zoom breakout groups right now and so the fact that this is an ongoing issue and we haven't moved that conversation forward on comprehensive consent education is very problematic and so i'd love to pick that up and i'd love to support the students with a Title IX coordinator at the high school. I, you know, being in constant communication with the students, I, I know that I have the skills to help them move their platform forward. Thank you. Thank you. Laura? Well, thank you so much for that question, because first I'd like to say how proud I am of the students for really picking this up as a movement and for, uh, for being the next generation to actually get this done. And I'm looking forward to uh, supporting them uh, not only through policy and through procedures, but in the things that they've asked for. They've been asking for uh, the expansion of their green dot curriculum that they've already had. They've had leaders on campuses uh, and we need to provide that expansion of that educational services. And we as a community need to look at where this is stemming from. And we need to think about fourth, fifth and middle schools and what is their exposure uh, to things we don't wanna talk about, but things like pornography. Because by the time our students get to high school and get to college, the level of access that they've had to that is going to impact their ability to control uh, those unintended urges that we definitely don't want them to have. And then we as a district need to be uh, very serious when we hear a complaint, when we hear a concern, not to just brush it aside. When my daughter was at Berkeley High School, uh, we had the issue ourselves, we experienced it. Uh, the vice principal did a very, um, he, he addressed it in a way that didn't include education. It didn't include restorative justice and it didn't stop uh, her from not being the first victim of this person or the last victim of this person. So again, I am uh, personally connected to making sure that no more students uh, endure what we endured. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And thank you for allowing me to squeeze that last question in. I just felt that it was super important uh, to, to bring the issue up. And, and uh, what I'd like to do if everyone's okay with it, since we are running long now, um, is limit the closing statements to a minute and a half rather than the two minutes that we had originally scheduled. Um, and I hope I'm not throwing you for a loop there, Martha. I hope you can- Oh, I got it. I'm on it. So uh, we're gonna start with Anna. Closing statements. Great, thank you, David. As the only candidate with the endorsement of the entire current Berkeley School Board and the only candidate with direct experience overseeing COVID-19 response efforts for schools on a professional level, I would be honored to serve our schools during this challenging time. My life experience as a first-generation college graduate and English language learner gives me the unique perspective of navigating the school system as a member of our most vulnerable communities. I understand firsthand the institutional barriers that our most vulnerable families face and I'm committed to addressing these as a school board member. Finally, this election for Berkeley School Board is very important. Our only Latinx school board member is not seeking re-election, and it's important that we have a school board that represents the rich diversity of our student body. 21% of our students identify as Latinx. With the endorsement of Latinos Unidos at Berkeley and many other elected officials and organizations, I'm looking forward to being a bridge between the school district and Berkeley's Latinx community. I hope to have your vote for one of the two seats for Berkeley School Board. Thank you, Thousand Oaks Neighborhood Association, for your time this evening. Thank you. Ms. Fandiar? Yeah, thank you again. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. You know, for me, you know, how can a student perform well if schools are not safe? Or if their families are struggling with basic needs? And how can teachers bring their best if they are not compensated or appreciated properly? So as you can see, the issues are connected. They are connected, and that's what I bring into this board if I'm elected. From looking at from the risk management perspective, root cause, and bring practical and pragmatic approaches, dealing with issues at the early stage, so we don't have to spend a lot of money later on, a lot of time and resources later on. 
So I would really appreciate your support, your vote, and please visit my uh, site at uh, imaniforschoolboard.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Norma? People don't get a chance socially or alone to take an honest look at the social structure to determine among each other how it's done or what it is that has happened to them. My intention is to give people the chance to say they don't like what happened to them when they were young or what's happening to their children or what's happening to them on a day-to-day -day basis to talk about their brothers. My brother got a degree in parasitology, a master's in world health, a doctoral in world health, and ended up his last couple of work decades selling AAA insurance. And I know you're all familiar with that kind of problem about people retaining reasonable employment. Everybody should have the opportunity to make meaningful production in this society. Now I'm talking about two-year-olds to 102-year-olds. Everybody wants to look like the parents who go off to work every day and bring home a paycheck at the end of the week, except that the parents that are doing that don't love that either. So we need to talk about how else to run the world. And of course, running the world another way is socialist and communist. It's taking care of us and Earth and enjoying life together, enjoying teaching, enjoying study, enjoying the moments of communication among each other. Thank you so much, Norma. Michael? Thank you. Um, we're in unprecedented emergency times. Um, on the school board, I will bring my extensive 16 year experience as a federal government regulatory compliance attorney in systems and procedures and in equity. I've implemented hundreds of cases across the state of California and more in other states, bringing schools into compliance with regard to access issues regarding sexual harm, disability access, and race and harassment in hostile environment. Uh, I'm also a first generation American, and I understand the experiences of our diverse student body. In particular, I want to bring a voice of allyship grounded in ethnic studies and restorative justice as one of the first Asian American school board members for many, many decades to bring a voice of Asian American progressive uh, viewpoints and values in allyship with other groups on the school board. In particular, uh, during shelter in place, I think that focusing on systems and procedures to not exacerbate already existing problems is absolutely critical. And in addition, being very careful about the funds that we use on outside counsel uh, that drive up a lot of the costs that result in our inability to hire in the uh, district are uh, issues that I will focus on. And uh, as a government attorney, I will serve as, in a sense, a freebie on the board for the school district to consult with. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jose Luis. Thank you. And it's a minute and a half, right? So let's try this. Um, Look, I've started today's session by saying I'm not a politician, and I'm not. If you ask me a question, I will try to answer it immediately and say that, you know, in some cases, I just don't know. That's okay. If I don't know, I will ask my policy team, who's made up of professors of the School of Education here at Berkeley, including my wife. I know I'm not the voice of the past board of directors. I'm not the voice of the union. I'm not the voice of politicians. I am the voice of parents. I am a frustrated parent who sees the bad level of service we're getting, which has resulted in horrible, inequitable outcomes. While I am a parent, I'm also a professional. I've worked at Fortune 500 companies. If you have a Toyota, Subaru, Lexus, or so many, other, so many of these other vehicles, I probably have a hand in the design of many of the systems there. I, if you have an old iPhone, I probably had a chip from one of the companies I worked at. And I've also worked at Habitat for Humanity and currently run a nonprofit. So what does all have in common is that I know how to get things done. I just don't talk about it. Education is important to me. It's a game changer. And, <laughs> thank you. And uh, in people's lives like myself, I am the son of farm workers. And here again, I just don't talk about uh, things. I actually do them. I said I would support this and I supported a college scholarship in my parents' name uh, for kids like me at Berkeley. During the COVID-19, 
we've not done well. Our ex experts so-called have put mediocre responses to bring us back, while other bigger systems like DLA and FIDE have done much, much better. My plan is fairly simple, is the attack in equity, I bring academic excellence and accountability. I have the experience that have led with my mind and also with my heart. I have followed all my actions, my words with actions. I hope you'll consider voting for me. I would be honored to earn your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura. Thank you so much and thank you, Tona, for this uh, important meeting. I am running for the Berkeley School Board primarily in response to COVID-19. I will work to ensure students can return to school safely, as I have for offices around the world, help BOSD navigate the financial pressures of reduced funding, and establish programs and services through the lens of equity and accountability for all students. I'm the only candidate that has years of experience on all our major district-wide committees. I have the endorsements from the Democratic Party, including the sole endorsement of the Asian Pacific American Caucus of Alameda County, and I am endorsed by BFT and BCCE. Why? Because these are times which call for someone who can hit the ground fully understanding the intricacies of BUSD funding sources, its programs, its strengths, its faults, and its personalities. Adding my experience as a financial and operations controller, and an advocate for equity and results, I am the candidate who can help BUSD navigate this unprecedented time as we re-engineer our schools. I am convinced that we can boost academic outcomes, social emotional development, increase funding for public education and its educators, and yes, ensure that every student has an equal chance to succeed. Please visit my website, laurababbitt.com, get a yard sign, volunteer, make a donation, and most importantly, vote and tell a friend to vote Laura Babbitt for Berkeley School Board this election. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And uh, everybody can unmute if you'd like to sort of applaud. And thank you all for coming. I need to ask you if people know how to save the chat in case they want to refer to it, that it's going to end with the closure of this screen. Uh, yeah, you can. each person is allowed to can save the chat. Um, each of the candidates, I think, um, if not all, have the ability, uh, have been posting links to their site. But we also have, um, we'll do a follow up email for people who come on the event break as well. Thank you all. We, uh, I think we've got some great answers tonight and we've covered some really important um, ground and some and, and important ter uh, territory. Two seats, six candidates. Um, I think it just shows how important this is for, you know, for the community. Um, and I think we got a good turnout. Hopefully, people will also be watching the video as well. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very Thank much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. So much. Thank Bye. You. And thanks to my team. Yay. My team. Great job, Thank team. <laughs> Thanks, Dave, for moderating. Great job hosting. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thanks for repeating the question so many times. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very Have much. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.